it's time to talk about a theorem that I'm uncertain if I should group with Pascal's triangle, the binomial theorem. It's quite simple yet powerful. If you want to expand this expression, x plus 1 to the n, you will find that the coefficients line up with the entries of Pascal's triangle. Honestly, it doesn't have that interesting of a proof. Simply, if you're looking for the coefficient of x to the k, you need to pick kx's and n minus k1's as each term in the expansion either has 1 or x from each of the n copies of x plus 1. The combinatorics work just right to give n choose k as the coefficient of x to the k, so you could also follow along a row on Pascal's triangle to get the coefficients as you go across. This is convenient if you want to find the sum of a row in Pascal's triangle, as setting x to 1 gives 2 to the n. Or maybe you want to find powers of 11, for which you can find the first few fairly easily with Pascal's triangle by setting x to 10 and giving each entry its own digit. Or maybe you care about modular arithmetic, and you want the last three digits of 7 to the 13th, for which it's probably easier to take 10 minus 3 to the 13th than use the binomial theorem to quickly find the last three entries algebraically. Clearly, this is a powerful theorem that has a multitude of applications. At the same time, it's the versatility that makes it hard to figure out where to place it. And if you don't introduce it properly, some of these applications feel more coincidental instead of intuitive. That's the main worry I have with grouping the binomial theorem with Pascal's triangle. There's so many different places it shows up that I'm not sure if it's right to group it with Pascal's triangle. And so today I want to talk about the implications of the binomial theorem and talk about the bridge between the scrappy world of combinatorics and the elegant world of algebra. The way you might first learn to prove the binomial theorem may be the algebraic approach of induction. You suppose the coefficients of the expansion follow what I've told you with the binomial theorem, then show that if it works for one of the expansions, the rest must follow the same pattern. The way you do this is by seeing what happens when you induct and multiply by another x plus 1. This creates two copies of the previous expansion, one of which is shifted over by x. With this, we want to combine terms next to each other. If you're working with pure algebra, you would introduce this by using Pascal's identity, which writes out the relation of Pascal's triangle. Of course, since it's Pascal's triangle, I can give a nicer visual intuition on this by copying the entire row at once and merging the consecutive terms to make the next row. And with induction, if it works in one case, it works in all of them, since repeatedly multiplying by x plus 1 will give the same pattern. And yes, this proof is once again fairly simple and doable. And now you can use it for everything you might want the theorem for right? Wrong. For one, I haven't actually fully proven the binomial theorem. You can make this work for negative numbers or even other rational and real numbers provided you give a definition of what your negative, fractional, and general real combinations are. I won't go into that because it's complicated and because two, this purely algebraic proof in no way tells us how we can use the binomial theorem outside of a strictly algebra world of working with polynomials. Enter generating functions, a formal way to connect algebra with combinatorics. The complicated definitions require a formal power series, but the basic idea is that we can count our categories using algebraic representations like powers of x and apply algebraic manipulations instead of just counting. The best example of this is the binomial theorem. If you have x plus 1 to the n, you can let x model heads and 1 model tails, and if you notice that I already talked about this, this is the combinatorial proof I started with. You have n flips and k of them are heads, and then you only have to pick k of n flips to be heads, and that is naturally the coefficient of x to the k. But generating functions can do better. Maybe you have dice you're rolling. Instead of just having x to the 0 and x to the 1 being heads and tails, we have six possible rolls. Well, we can give each number its own exponent instead of just 0 and 1. 1 goes to x to the 1, 2 goes to x to the 2, and so on up to 6 assigned to x to the 6. What's amazing is that it's still a generating function, and if we care about the sum of n rolls, we can simply exponentiate x plus x squared plus x cubed plus x to the fourth plus x to the fifth plus x to the sixth. The coefficients will tell you how many ways you can get your sums. And generating functions can even do better. Instead of giving the sheer number of ways to roll a given number, it even works with probability. Putting the odds instead and exponentiate will go straight to the probabilities of the sum, which can take care of maybe a weighted coin that shifts probabilities to have a 70% chance of heads. Just expand 0.7x plus 0.3 to the n, and the generating function gives you an algebra problem for probabilities. There is so much more to talk about when it comes to using generating functions, but a lot of it can get really complicated really quick. Today, I just wanted to talk about the binomial theorem. Not just what incredible uses you can squeeze out of it, but I wanted to show how the binomial theorem is also an awesome bridge that brings an algebraic toolbox into counting.